Okay. Uh, Tushar, are we live, by the way? Uh, just a minute, sir. I'm uh, just taking it head over here. Yes, sir. We are live. Uh, yes, sir. So, good afternoon, everybody. A warm welcome from uh, Entrepreneurship Cell of uh, Surinam Khalsa College. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, ma'am. Yeah, good, good afternoon, Tushar. Everyone, participants, very good afternoon to you. And a uh, very warm welcome from Entrepreneurship Cell of Guru Nanak Khalsa College. On behalf of uh, Dr. Pratiksha, ma'am, the head of Entrepreneurship Cell, I would like to introduce our today's speaker, uh, Mr. Akshat Kadam. So, he is uh, the CEO of uh, DevLearn Technologies. And it's my very pleasure to introduce him to among you. So he has uh, done his MTech in electrical engineering from IIT Bombay and uh, specialization in signal, signal process. He has also experience of working with Sony Corporation for about four plus years and a research scientist in uh, volumetric uh, imaging department. He has worked upon introducing motion parallax in multi stack uh, domain uh, project by. Uh, omnidirectional uh, de department video and uh, also worked on a real time pre video system for commercial broadcasting product showcase. Also, we have with us uh, Dr. Vidya Kadam, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Vidya Kadam, ma'am, is uh, also managing director of uh, DevLearn Technology and uh, she has over uh, 20 years of experience in. Okay, uh, thanks for the introduction, Tushar. I hope uh, my screen is visible to everybody. I'd just like to confirm that before we get started. Yes, sir, it is visible. Okay, thank you very much. All right, uh, I'll proceed then. And uh, if there are any technical uh, inconsistencies you may notice in the stream, please let me know. Uh, I will make adjustments while we go. OK. So uh, first of all, uh, very good afternoon to everybody. And uh, I hope everyone's safe at home and uh, you know, like laid back and hope we can just have a nice afternoon session over here. OK. So welcome to an introduction to Python and data science and business intelligence. So I will talk a little bit about uh, what this session this session is originally intended to be an orientation for uh, an oncoming uh, Python in batch initiative that we have uh, tied up with JN Khalsa College for and all to all the students that are currently viewing and attending um, I would first like to give you just a brief about what these technologies are about and how learning these specific programming languages and technologies will help you uh, in your careers and in your studies as well. So although uh, this, this talk was titled a little bit more specific to Python in data science, but I have switched it a little bit uh, when I noticed that most of our attendees here are students, like a grouping more than 95%. So let me first uh, share with you a quick agenda. But before we start, uh, this is a quick introduction of myself. Uh, I'm sure Tushar has already covered the points, but uh, basically my name is Akshat Kadam and I head uh, technology and academic initiatives at Devlin. So yeah, it's a pleasure to interact with everybody. And uh, yeah, okay, let's get started then. All right, so this is the agenda for what I, all the points that I want to touch upon today uh, in our talk. And um, I have mostly chosen these points because um, what we have noticed uh, in our time so far is that uh, most students are uh, still uh, the awareness levels are still fairly low about the origins and uh, 
the main concepts of data science and what is uh, the changing trends that we're seeing in the industry and why these technologies are important. So I'd first like to uh, go the other way around and give you uh, a brief about what data science is and how it stems from how it helps with AI and how big data plays a huge role over here. And finally, we'll examine a little bit more closely about uh, what exactly these data scientists and analysts do in their jobs. There is also an additional term for data engineering. And uh, what is exactly business intelligence and how it fits in this entire big picture? And finally, uh, coming to the crux of the point that I'd like to make today is why Python has become such a popular programming language today and uh, what has led to its rise in popularity and how it has become a common thread in all of the data science analysis workflows that we're seeing today actually in the industry. OK, so let's get started. I'll touch upon each of these major top, uh, major points uh, as we start exploring them. OK, so I'll start with, uh, before we actually get started with any main points, what I want to, uh, I want to put contextualized for everybody is that uh, the reason that uh, India today is still lacking behind as compared to the rest of the world in terms of uh, employability and even competency in these fields, despite having such a high number of graduates, uh, such a huge talent pool, is that uh, there is little, there is a little bit less awareness and somehow students and even fresh graduates uh, are finding themselves unprepared for an industry that is changing extremely fast. And uh, what is happening is because technologies that uh, companies are adopting are changing so fast their requirements of uh, their employees are also changing accordingly and people are not able to keep up with these skill sets these requirements and what our role as Develon technologies here is that we want to ally with uh, higher education institutions and institutes that cater to so many you know uh, the next generation of graduates and we want to catch you up and keep you up with these technologies so that you will find yourself uh, relevant when you enter the job market and you'll be able to actually become self-reliant in this uh, very, very changing world, especially a world that has changed so much in just the last year. Okay. So uh, let's just start with a small history lesson. Uh, I want to touch upon uh, how this data science field actually started upon, uh, came to be and uh, how it has evolved uh, to this point today. So. Uh, first of all, I'll touch a little bit about what artificial intelligence is later. But uh, if any student here is familiar with the term data mining, uh, I think it is sufficient to say that this is something that started in the late 90s uh, after uh, the internet boom started. And this was uh, you know, coined by a few scientists, uh, of course, in academia, who were uh, trying to use statistical methods to obtain inferences from data. Now, this seems like a very uh, you know, basic concept, but it was extremely revolutionary at the time. And what happened is from that point onwards, right until uh, the mid 2000s, is that uh, there were certain scientists who came up with the idea that we should combine data mining and computer science. And that's how we actually came, uh, the term or you know, the field of data science was conceived. So, Basically, what they kind of did is that they made statistics and they made it extremely technical and uh, they kind of added a whole computational flavor to it. OK, so this is how data science actually came about. But what actually accelerated this field is that uh, is with the advent or you would say the evolution of, you know, the Internet or the web from 1.0 to 2.0. Now, um, this was actually a big monumental leap and it created a paradigm shift in the way data is generated uh, in across economic activity and uh, I'll, that's how that is actually the fuel it created the fuel for what we call uh, you know uh, data science research or you could say artificial intelligence including machine learning or even deep learning applications so i'll talk about those terms a little bit ahead now, uh, and also I'll uh, elaborate on Web 2.0 shortly. All right. So another thing that I want to touch upon is 
while data science and big data was developing up to this point in 2012, uh, our traditional concepts or uh, conceived notions of artificial intelligence or AI were extremely primitive and they were also uh, more of towards the line that people were convinced that AI as a technology is infeasible and uh, it will not lead to anything big. But there was a big uh, a milestone change that happened in 2012. Now, this came about with a landmark research paper by Professor Geoffrey Hinton of University of Toronto. And uh, what he did was uh, a very interesting experiment uh, when he leveraged big data with our old methods of artificial intelligence. And what he saw, found is that uh, the combination of these two leads to something very exceptional. And what that led to is a complete revolution from that point onwards. So right from 2012 to the current date, you see AI research has exploded across all fields of study. And uh, data science has now come to you know, the complete forefront, the spotlight uh, for uh, across, you know, not just academia, but also industry and science, technology, wherever you look. So uh, that's how even the word data science, the term, the field, it kind of came to the forefront where people started taking notice that, OK, this is something that we have to be more cognizant about, more aware about. And finally, we come here today when we see that data analytics, science, and engineering are uh, some of the most popular and you know uh, future-proof jobs today. Because uh, there are so many uh, speculations that people make that you know with the increase of automation, uh, jobs are in danger, and there is a lot of speculation in the market. But there is one thing that everybody agrees with is that these sort of job roles that involve actually dealing with big data and analyzing it and also applying scientific and engineering methods to it is a job field that is going to be at the center of most economic activity in the future. OK, so I hope that this was uh, a bit of a, a good uh, introduction and you know a bit of a small timeline about uh, how this field of data science actually developed. So let me just transition a little bit to uh, what you should think about when you think about artificial intelligence. Now, uh, I'm sure many students today might have at least heard the term machine learning or deep learning in some context. And if not, you would have definitely heard AI, at least in your newspaper or some article somewhere, because everybody's talking about it. It's extremely uh, hip or in culture and popular media. Now, uh, there is something that not everybody touches upon in popular media is that how these three things relate. So uh, one thing that I want to uh, at least make clear to all our viewers today is that uh, at least when you go back from this talk, uh, I want you to have a good notion of you know what, uh, how these technologies relate to each other. So uh, let me just say for now that uh, AI is a general term. It covers uh, all conceivable types of intelligence. So it is, in its more purest theoretical form, artificial intelligence. So uh, although we cover the space of human intelligence, there can be intelligence that is very different from us, uh, a kind of intelligence even we will not conceive about. But uh, that is that, that would uh, make this talk extremely philosophical and uh, metaphysical. So uh, I'm not going to touch upon that. And that is not what even we mostly as society are concerned with today. What we are concerned with is uh, is to actually expand upon and explore all forms of human intelligence that we have tried to replicate in machines today. So, and that is what machine learning is. That is basically machine learning is a complete, it's a field of study. Uh, it's full of, at its core, it's mathematics and statistics. And it basically, it studies how computer logic, you know, or so machines, so to say, uh, their algorithms or you know their methods, their processing can improve or with the use of data mining and you know statistical techniques. So the same methods that machines would use till now, we change the method a bit and we give it a lot of real world data. And we see how the same ability of the machine to decide certain things to predict how that improves. So that is entirely the field of machine learning. And finally, uh, just to give you a small teaser about what deep learning is, uh, deep learning is, in essence, completely falls within machine learning. 
it is an entire subset of it and uh, it's basically a new type of machine learning that leverages massive amounts of data so similar to that 2012 research i mentioned earlier uh, and it uses new techniques especially parallel computing and so many things that have evolved in the last decade uh, especially the concept of neural networks to surpass even humans in performance in various fields so let me just uh, name two fields that uh, probably you might be aware about so uh, this is something that is not recent it is about uh, i'd say at least 5 years old where uh, the uh, the world champion at this uh, not so popular in india but at least popular in the rest of the world it's called go uh, it is a many times more complex game than chess and google was able to create an ai that could beat this world champion at this game so this is the first example of how we see that uh, ai or machines can actually defeat humans at something and uh, that was although it was about 5 6 years ago what happened is in just 3 more years uh, we have ai that is defeating humans in much more complex tasks so this is uh, i i think some students might be aware of uh, what this game is it's called dota uh and it's pretty it has a very big cult following uh there are world championships for this with huge cash prizes all over the world and um, it's an extremely complex game with uh, an entire gamut of characters and moves and skill sets and uh they were able to design ai to completely defeat even world champions at this game so we are seeing and this is all pow- uh possible through methods such as deep learning so uh this is just a bit of a teaser as to what the cap- the capabilities of ai can be uh so let's move on a bit and uh, i want to first talk about what exactly is big data now um uh, people hear the term big data and they use it uh as misnomers they use it a little bit incorrectly uh very often uh i want to talk about how big data started oh. and also to give you uh more insight and background as to why big data is relevant today to us okay so uh, i'm sure most students right now in college today they will probably not be uh, aware of websites such as this you know if this format uh, so these are web 1.0 websites uh, this is msn.com there were similar websites called yahoo bing uh, earlier versions of bing and also netscape you know those browsers so this that was the state of the internet back then that was more like a digital encyclopedia and uh consumers of the internet were just seeing information and that's it they were not sending back much information but what happened is that with the evolution of 1.0 to 2.0 although you don't need to understand what's happening inside them what you can what you at least need to get is that the internet became much more interactive and much more driven by the users and not just the original content publishers now with apps such as facebook twitter social media websites where you interact with things every day we have people that are expressing opinions uh interacting with things and leaving behind a digital footprint about what a person is doing on the internet every day now this is happening at a worldwide scale and this is generating a lot more data then what we originally did so uh the scale at which data was generated was completely blew up uh when the internet evolved and that is why we today have big data so let me just give you a little bit more about what this big data is actually doing what is possible with it is that because data has evolved so much across all sectors of economic activity uh people's data can now be used across all aspects of a person's life right from you know healthcare travel education even uh, communications of course because mobile numbers uh, were the original you know piece of personal information that a, uh, that a person had uh, before you know web 2.0 and of course you don't have to i don't have to tell you how amazon and netflix uh, are completely using your own data to predict and uh, recommend you uh, what what is the next thing that you might want to buy or what might want to watch online okay so this is what is possible with big data and um, let me also give you like a few applications about uh, what people can usually do with it is that um, say for example you have even a uh, say a google search or a passport scan your online shopping history 
uh, all of these can be collected, aggregated, and monetized. So by monetizing, we see that the ad market today is completely driven by data. And that is, of course, also sometimes uh, why you see certain companies that are coming in the news for uh, you know certain say uh, high profile scams or you know certain uh, uh, issues where you know uh, where companies are selling data that users have not uh, given permission to and that is creating a whole new uh, type of problems today that people never even conceived about and the law doesn't even exist for these laws because for these issues because they were just never a problem before now uh, let me also just say that because data is exploding so fast and uh, what people are also trying to do today is that they're trying to make algorithms and they're trying to increase computing capacity uh, that will keep up with this sort of data processing uh, every year because not only are we churning more data every year we're also increasing the rate of processing of this data year on year. And this is only possible uh, through hardware and software innovation. And um, of course, software innovation will keep happening, but hardware innovation is going to drive a lot of this in the future. Uh, some A small uh, heuristic I wanted to place in front of you is that they often said in 2015 that our smartphones back then had reached the point that one smartphone had more computing capacity than all of NASA, uh, when whatever they used in the 1969 moon landing mission. And that is just inside your pocket. Today is 2021, and they say in just a little bit more time, one smartphone might have enough raw computing power to uh, overcome that of an entire human brain. And within just about another 10 to 15 years, we might see that uh, the same device could be scaled up to cover all of humanity. So that is completely mind boggling. And it's hard to even conceive what that means. But uh, if if there's anything you pick up from this, it's that uh, processing these large amounts of data, uh, distributed computing, all of these concepts are only going to become more important from here on out. OK, so uh, that was the first section on you know what is AI, what, what is big data, how these two things are playing together. Uh, I'd just like to take a quick break and see if uh, there are any questions from, uh, say, the live chat or from anybody in the meet. Tushar, can you just uh, correspond on that? Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. So if anybody has any questions in the uh, currently who are in the meeting, uh, I'd be happy to uh, probably field a few. And we can maybe field uh, chat questions in the end. All right. Uh, let's proceed in that way. OK, so let me just give you a very, very small teaser. This is a small section. I just want to talk about how jobs are changing in the industry and uh, what is this evolving nature of jobs. So the first, I think uh, it's important to pull a few statistics here. And um, what you will probably see over here is that these job roles uh, over the see the past 10 years uh, ever since, and this is very well in line with you know the timeline that I have explained so far. Now. Uh, what we're seeing on job markets, on recruiting websites, everywhere in statistics is that jobs with keywords like, you know, data uh, analyst, scientist, data scientist, or even data engineering, uh, these sorts of keywords and uh, nomenclatures are becoming more and more popular, more relevant out there in the market now. So uh, often, if you looked at the same recruiting websites, you look at Indeed, you look at Nokia.com, probably, you know, five years ago, you would not find all, you know, these many job descriptions like this. But today it's completely different. And that is completely in line with uh, the need for corporations to use all of this data that they're generating to solve their problems, to create new products for them, and to create more efficient products for them. So. I will touch upon what exactly these data scientists and analysts do a little bit ahead. But I think something that you should be very, it's a big takeaway for everybody watching today is that uh, this is one of the few fields where you know candidates with less than 5%, uh, five years of experience are covering three fourths of the job market. Now, this is mind boggling because if you were to look at, say, uh, programming in traditional languages, like, say, Java or C, uh, the fraction of uh, freshers or you know people with less than five years experience is much lesser 
uh, among everybody who are commanding jobs today in the market. Now, a big part of this is that this field itself is less than five to ten years old. So, uh, it is only natural that most professionals that are right now in the market uh, don't have much experience al already. So, I would say this is a very very good time to get into this field and to at least start exploring what your options are. Uh, there is no one fixed track. You can. There is an entire pyramid of uh, you know ranges of tasks that you can explore, uh, careers that you can explore ahead. So I'll get on that. I'll uh, talk more about that pyramid a little bit ahead. And the final point I want to raise over here is that uh, these are some of the programming languages that are becoming extremely popular for these job roles. And uh, what you will notice here is that Python currently stands at number two. Although this is uh, a statistic from 2007, uh, I think a more recent statistic placed it extremely close to number one. And Python and R are absolutely the top two languages of choice for anybody uh, even trying to have a foundation uh, in this field, like in this entire range of job roles. OK, so let me talk about a little bit more about what these jobs are like. So uh, I'm talking about these analyst jobs and the data scientist jobs. But what exactly are companies looking for in these jobs? So uh, there is a very common uh, saying, you know, at least within the community of uh, current industry experts, wherein you know any data analyst or scientist, he when he's working on the field on the ground, he needs he basically has four uh, quadrants of responsibility or four skill sets that uh, everybody is judged upon, and uh, those are like, namely you know analytics, specific domain knowledge that is depending on what sort of field he's working in. Uh, programming, of course, because he has to uh, implement everything that you know he's trying to analyze, and finally communication, because uh, a person doesn't work alone in a vacuum. If you are an analyst for a company, you have to you have the responsibility to communicate your findings to management, because uh, finally the key of analytics and data science jobs is that they are uh, giving people the power to decide what will happen in the future and what is the best thing that I need to do today so that my product, my company is going to do better in the future. And that is why if today you are an analyst that has the ability to analyze your company's data to you know, uh, create predictions, then you should also be able to communicate them. And these are some of, uh, I've just picked out you know two very popular uh, companies that are hiring tremendously uh, in large quantities and of course, I don't need to tell you about Amazon, but you know this is a common, a very template uh, job description that you will find if you look at Amazon's job listings. And um, this is extremely well in line with you know the four pillars of what a data scientist needs to have in his job, in his uh, skill set, which is you know uh, analytics, communication, domain knowledge. So, for example, if you're uh, working in a ad agency, so you should know. What are the sort of ads that you know your agency is doing? Say you're talking if you're working at say for example Amazon, uh, you need to know what e-commerce is about, what how Amazon works, how is what is the Amazon platform about, and that is how you will actually be able to uh, create any insight for the company that it will help it do better than what it is already doing today. Okay, so of course this domain knowledge changes everywhere, but the basic skills that is within analytics and programming. Uh, these are something that everybody has to develop in every foundation. All right. So that was a little bit about how these job roles are changing and you know how industries are kind of switching up uh, the kind of candidates they're looking for more popular. And um, I think everybody might have seen that there is so much, uh, you know, the word data science, data analytics, data engineer, I've thrown that around a lot. Now, uh, also, Let's also take a little bit of a deeper look at uh, what exactly uh, would a person do at these jobs, or you know, uh, what is expected of you at this job, and how you would perceive this entire field of study to be. All right. So let me be extremely clear: um, data science is not about creating complicated models uh, to you know, uh, possibly show very flashy trends or using extremely complex technologies. Data science is 
about answering questions, basic questions for the company you're working for and helping them improve their business. So, uh, and the questions that you ask, the questions that are asked inside the company, wherever you work, I would like everybody, you know, who is listening today to just do a little bit of a thought experiment and put themselves in the shoes that say they are a data analyst at a company uh, and they are working with seniors, with management, with project leaders. And, you know, the company has a product, the company has a service and um, they are generating data from that service. You know, uh, it could be any service. It could be I could have a small tailor business and uh, I could be managing clients online through, you know, a sort of uh, an online e-shop and my e-shop could be generating data for me every day a lot. And I am a simple analyst at this company. Now, uh, the work that I will do will depend upon the sort of questions that are being asked uh, within you know, my current uh, workplace. So for example, and uh, this could be all sorts of questions, but mostly, you know, there are three types, three main types that uh, we talk about. So uh, of course, one is predictive when people are more interested in what happens in the, what is going to happen and how can we maximize, you know, our profit or our sales, you know, in the coming time. So that would, so what should we do for that? So that is how you would do predictive analysis. And for example, uh, prescriptive analysis would talk about what is the current state of, you know, the business or the product. And um, I could be looking at data and uh, your boss could be questioning you as, why is this happening? Why are uh, so many people logging in, but not clicking on the buy button? Uh, what if, what will happen if this sort of trend continues? So that is how you could come up with prescriptive charts. And finally, descriptive talks about, uh, goes more into the details as to uh, what is actually the reasons for what is, for why some things are happening. And uh, I think that mostly these three verticals or these pillars would, would very well encompass uh, what are all the questions that you would uh, sort of encounter, you know, within this entire field. And, uh, you know, believe it or not, for all the flashy, all the sophisticated uh, job descriptions that you see in the market. Finally, when you're at the job, these are the questions you are getting. So uh, you are getting extremely simple questions. Why is this happening? So we have this product. Uh, can you take a look at this? See how we can improve. This is the sort of work that you would do as a data analyst or a scientist. All right. So uh, the next thing I'd like to touch upon is something that is not often talked about in popular media for sure, and even amongst uh, you know industry experts for for some reason they don't touch a lot upon about this because uh, possibly because of its complexity or anything. But I think uh, this chart, this right here, this pyramid is should be your biggest takeaway in this little small orientation here today, and that is. Uh, what exactly happens, you know, within this entire pyramid of data science, and uh, when? What are the sort of things that you would do, and what is the most important thing? So, as any pyramid structure goes, the base is the most important. Without the base, nothing above it will stand, and uh, that is the the most mundane and uh, basic thing of data collection. So, many basic things like you know, obtaining data, acquisition of data. So. If I am an ad agency, uh, if I am, say, I'm a marketing agency, uh, how would I get data of my prospective candidates? So acquiring that data, that is collection. Now, uh, you could do it to your existing products, simple. You know, it's it's a very mundane engineering task. Uh, and there, and from there, you actually start into venturing into the fields that data engineers work on. So that's where you talk about uh, data pipelining or you know storing cataloging information so so much of the data around over 80 to 90 percent of data that is currently out there in the world is unstructured and um, we just if we take data that data as is you cannot do anything useful with it what you do need to do is process it a bit align it normalize it i i would like everybody to think of this process uh, very similar to analogous to cooking um you cannot use raw materials as they are you have to do a little bit of you know preparation work uh you probably have to marinate certain things chop cut dice so 
I think that is how you should also uh, perceive this entire you know pipeline as and this pyramid. And you would venture up from you know basic uh, software tasks to data engineering. And here is where this is the area where you would uh, the crux of you know any analyst lies. Where uh, and this is I would also like to mention is uh, where most companies today are. You know apart from the extremely advanced tech giants who are constantly innovating and uh, creating products that are extremely new and uh, you know pushing the state of the art usually uh, yes a lot of their work happens over here but for most companies for you you know if you are listening today uh, what will likely happen is that companies are looking for a person who will do this work so simple analytics simple feature training uh, very very basic uh, pattern recognition. So, you know, that is where the core of most insights come from. Business insights come from here. And this is uh, where the blanket term of business intelligence also comes from. So a business intelligence agent is somebody who has uh, the skills to do this analysis and then move on to and also has the communication skills to push it to marketing staff to push it to clients to push it to higher management so if you are think of yourself as a businessman uh, a person who's growing a business but also knows how to grow it so that is where the intelligence of you know uh, the intelligence of artificial intelligence mixed with business that is how you should think about business intelligence and finally uh, you can step up your analytics by you know creating hypothesis uh, this is where you start venturing into the field of science, where uh, you take, you have an assumption of how things are when you don't really know, and then test over that assumption. And finally, you realize that, okay, my guess was correct or my guess was wrong. If it was wrong, I'll change something, I'll explore more. If it is correct, I have something that was not known before. And this is value because uh, when a company knows something that other companies don't know, that is how the company has the ability to go ahead of the competition. So this is why uh, this pyramid of how you should perceive this entire field uh, comes into picture. So if you do not know how to do basic uh, pattern recognition or feature analysis, you would possibly, you shouldn't know or you shouldn't be studying deep learning or, uh, you know, probably natural language processing, all those high funda terms that are thrown around in the market. Because that is exactly like, you know, if you have a dish and you are putting seasoning on it, you're putting kesar on it, but you have not put salt, you have not put pepper, you know, the basics are not there. So, which is why I would like everybody to uh, completely, you know, absorb this chart. And um, I should, this should be a biggest takeaway today. All right, so um, I think, when you talk about data scientists or you know the sort of job descriptions that you have out there in the market uh, they also differ a lot sometimes you know many students uh, or many people professionals they kind of tell me that uh, hey i was looking at data scientist uh, job descriptions on you know the internet i was searching around and i found that these job descriptions they keep changing so much i mean uh, they are very different. They're not all very similar. Uh, some look very, very uh, constrained or you know, uh, extremely narrow, but some are extremely broad. There are some jobs that talk about this entire space of things and some that just talk about one of them. So uh, to answer that question, I'd just like to say that uh, the size of the company that you're probably going to work at, uh, that has a big role to play in you know, uh, what is the sort of work that you're expected to do at what label. So let me just uh, just to give you a little bit of heuristic. So uh, if you're a small to medium sized firm, uh, basic data collection, that is the domain of you know, any basic engineer, software engineer, whoever made the platform or whoever is collecting data on the field, uh, this is their domain. And if uh, you actually want to work with storing, cataloging, retrieving this data, that's the field of data engineers. And finally, the analysis or the actual process of coming up with inferences uh, of that data. That is, you know, the whole scientist or analyst role. So uh, usually this term is used uh, 
you know interchangeably between companies but uh, that is probably most likely because the companies themselves are not too sure about what they want and uh, they just want somebody who will solve their problems so as a student as an applicant uh, you know if you do get the job your first thing should priority should be to understand the business of the company and you give them what they need you sense what they need and then you give it to them so uh, that is how companies are trying to you know uh, keep up with this entire changing landscape because uh, if you're doing something you have never done before probably would falter a little bit so that is also what we're seeing with so many companies today so when we have so many various and you know uh, mixed up job descriptions so but uh, what you will see in big corporations companies that know what they're doing uh, they are probably a lot more structured and systematic with uh, how they uh, get candidates how they train them how they use them so roles are extremely well defined but uh, again without any doubt as an analyst this is your main uh, the crux of what you will be doing and this is where most value is generated today uh, in the market all right so i'll just uh, give a very very small uh, point about how ai and deep learning features into this with these big corporations is that uh, what they look for is that because these corporations are extremely right uh, they do know exactly what sort of research they're trying to do and um, what are exactly the sort of algorithms the sort of domain specific knowledge they require so it, these roles fall more under you know uh, you would finally find these roles as you know core machine learning or you know uh, core research into certain domains so that's why they probably look for people with a masters or a head but uh, nevertheless these roles are completely open to anybody who has the skills uh to you know fulfill the requirements so i think this uh, everybody can you know just try to take a good look at this and probably even uh, study it up a little bit more in your free time okay so uh finally again okay, uh, the last thing that i want to touch upon today is how python fits in with uh, this entire you know big picture and um, like how it's connected to this entire workflow in the world why it's relevant to everybody today and why it's going to continue to grow uh, even further today okay so uh, tushar can i just uh, check in once more to see if anybody has any further questions uh, yes sir there are few questions and uh, i am posting it in our chat this google meet chat you can see it from here all right uh, so okay if that's the case then let's just tackle these in the end i think we are mostly in the uh, towards the final sections of the talk so we may finish in another 10 15 minutes uh, depending on how much time we have left let's uh, tackle questions sure sir okay right all right so coming to python and its popularity now um, this is something that i found extremely interesting and Uh, as you know somebody who has certain development experience and you know someone who has interacted with a lot of developers uh to me the most important indicator of any programming languages uh popularity is how that programming language does on uh stack overflow and other you know debugging forums so uh if you have done any sort of professional programming you will soon come to know uh, that you know as a programmer you usually don't you know remember the syntax of your programming language all the time you know i have uh, done you know certain say for example let me take a very simple example uh, if i have to open a certain type of file in python i have probably done it so many times i've done it 10 15 20 times you know uh, in the last 1 2 years but even today if i start doing it i will just scratch my head a little bit and wonder uh how do you do this one a little bit again i know how you do it but i don't remember the exact command and that's when i go to stack overflow i you know quickly google uh how to do this in python so that's usually the most common thing any developer does and a developer that says that he doesn't use stack overflow is probably lying and or he's not a very good developer so 
these are statistics that Stack Overflow has uh, brought about how Python and you know questions about Python have grown in the last you know just uh, six years from 12 to 18, and uh, taking extrapolating these to 2020, this has now become the number one programming language for which questions are asked. And uh, although this is a growth rate, and uh, maybe the total questions for Java or JavaScript are a little bit higher, but Python is growing at an exceptional rate. And uh, I will talk about, uh, like, just to give you a few short reasons as to why. But uh, this should be, this is unlike anything we have ever seen before. So no language till now has uh, become this popular and this widely used ever. So this is the first instance of a widely dominated uh, programming language you're seeing. Because, and this is, uh, you should uh, just see these uh, statistics as you know a conservative benchmark because uh, because Python is used so much not just uh, technical people not just engineers accountants uh, even statisticians are using this people there are certain instances of people in the arts field who are using Python for some visualization purpose some uh, basic work and that is the beauty of it so let me just uh, touch upon what are the various types of people that are actually using it today. So Python is, without a question, the world's fastest growing programming language. And uh, you know it is extremely popular, especially in the young crowd. You know, those who are freshers in the industry, those who are uh, just growing now. And of course, without question, software engineers use it. But so do mathematicians. You know, For basic uh, calculation work, for simulations, data analysts, with, of course, it goes without saying, Scientists use it too, you know, for basic simulations. And this would probably surprise some people, but accountants and even network engineers are now able to use Python because Python is making everybody's life easy on the job. And I think uh, I don't need to explain that uh, Python has now become an extremely popular language even for kids. We have uh, kids in eighth standard, ninth standard, who are starting to study Python. and they are able to create very, very small scale, but still innovative and interesting projects in this. And because it is sparking creativity, uh, it has become so, that's how its popularity has grown. And if there is something that I should mention is that, you know, you, the natural question that comes, you know, it pops up is why? Like, why is everybody using it? So uh, why does an accountant who doesn't normally know programming, why, why is he you, able to use or is, preferring Python over some other tool. So the simplest answer for that is uh, of its high level syntax. Now, uh, probably some somebody might, you know, people might wonder what is high level? Does it mean high funda, like high sophisticated? No, high level actually means uh, extremely simple, easy to understand. So uh, to give you a, a sort of a visual, uh, the closer you are to hardware, to actual, memory management, the closer you are to uh, actually working with binary digits to with bits of ones and zero, that is low level. So low level, say for example, uh, assembly programming would be low level. Uh, a little bit above that would be C programming, where you know you directly handle, deal with addresses or memory on your computer. And uh, you're probably manipulating the memory addresses on your computer. So that's where C programming becomes you know complicated because Everybody hates pointers. Nobody wants to uh, the hassle of dealing with them. But with Python, you do not have to worry about those things. It just takes care of everything, and um, that's why you know even commerce students, art students, they they find that it is it is the closest thing you will find uh, in programming that is similar to writing in English in just plain English. So, and that is why it has become so popular. And even kids are able to do it because of that. Okay, so uh, there are four, you know, main reasons that uh, describe why you know this entire thing is Python is so useful across everything. So, uh, and of course, like I'll just touch a little bit about each of them is that uh, it is extremely cross-platform, and uh, what that means is that uh, people who are learning this language today can they work with people who don't who have not learned this language yet but have been working for a long time, say um you are working on you know you've you've only programmed python for windows till now 
tomorrow you go to a company that uses Linux, that uh, where they use work on Mac, uh, you would probably uh, be in trouble if you were working with C or C++. But uh, with Python, you you can. It is you won't even feel the difference when you change platforms into you know when, when operating systems change completely, and there's a large number of libraries. And the best part is that Python can. Uh, interface extremely well with languages like C++, Java, traditional languages, you know, more uh, medium to low level languages that are useful for writing professional grade software. So tomorrow, if you go to a company as even a software engineer and or a tester, and you find that all the developers are working with C, C++, Java, and you're working with Python, you can still work with them because Python can interface with these languages well. So it's it's definitely the you know the most simple and you know eyes closed the best choice to make, and of course after that high level, huge community like I mentioned, uh, if you have any problems you go to Stack Overflow, you probably will be it will be easier to find the solution to an answer for in Python than it would be in some other uh, young language like Ruby or Scala or uh, any any of the budding languages that are out there. All right. So I think we're close to the final point that I'd like to make is that uh, since we were talking so much about data science and business intelligence, uh, it is worth mentioning that Python and R programming, uh, along with it, are the foundation uh, where all of these engineering, science analytics, and even the specific domain research uh, rests upon. So with the basic tool set of programming and uh, you know the ability to quickly script something, is you will be able to jump into an engineering role. Let's say if you want to work with Hadoop or you want to work with Spark, uh, anything related to uh, you know data pipelining or uh, that sort of gritty work, or you want to move into analytics, a little bit more uh, glamorous work of you know working actually on business problems. So again, you will be using Python for that. And finally, if you are doing even you know the the top or you know the the pinnacle the spearhead of work say in any sort of research you want to work with neural networks you want to work with deep learning uh, you want to use it in all these applications such as ar vr or even domain specific work like uh, say machine vision or sort of uh, bioinformatics for that matter uh, python again is going to be the language you're going to program in because all of these platforms they do use python inside it all right so I think that covers uh, most of the points I wanted to raise today. And uh, just one last thing I wanted to state is that, again, uh, this little talk over here is just uh, you know, an orientation as to uh, why you should sign up for this course that uh, we are very soon starting with Khalsa College. And uh, you know, it's going to be it's a completely foundational course. If you have zero programming experience, you, are, uh, you can join. You will be able to catch up. And we will be starting from absolute zero basics uh, with the assumption that you have never written any line of code. And it's just that easy. And finally, of course, it's online. It's going to be very you know, uh, well paced. You will not be everyone. I think uh, your exams are over a little bit uh, you know, trying to de-stress. So this is going to be uh, a very lightweight class. You will have hands-on uh, experience in writing code wherein uh, if you are seeing something that you know the teacher or the presenter is talking about, and at the same time you will be able to write it down, you can probably even do it on your mobile phone. We have the tools for that. And I think the best part about this is that this is completely sponsored by uh, our collaboration with Rusa, so it's entirely free of charge. I will strongly recommend that everybody uh, signs up to you know the course, and uh, I'm sure. Uh, uh, the coordinators will be sharing a small registration link with everybody. So, uh, yeah, just to uh, fill that up. Okay. Right. So that's it for the talk today. I think uh, we're doing just uh, perfectly well in time. We just have a little bit of time to answer a few questions. Okay. Right. Okay. So let's come back to our discussions here. Um, All right, Tushar, uh, shall we field a few questions from yeah, the live stream? 
Okay. Let me just uh, take yeah. a look at a few questions I'm seeing here. So I have posted a few questions, sir, in our chat box. Sure, sure. Okay. Let me just take a look at them. Sure, sir. Yeah. All right. So uh, we have a few questions that I think uh, you have handpicked for us. And uh, so Priyanshu says, uh, do we learn all of Python here? So yeah, uh, to some extent, I think uh, uh, all of Python would mean uh, it is an unending you know, list of libraries that would keep going and going. But to cover the fundamentals, yes, we are covering everything from your very, very first program of you know, just writing hello world to uh, creating, you know, connecting things to databases or possibly uh, touching upon a little bit of machine learning libraries like, say, Pandas or NumPy, which is numerical Python. So uh, you would get to work with real world you know data samples and do a little bit of analysis also on that and create some interesting charts and visuals so we take you from absolute uh, zero knowledge to a very very good level of understanding and you know completely primed to start learning anything in data science uh, with our course okay all right so let's go to the next question i'm seeing here uh, from pranay uh, so all right, so his question is that what is required to build a strong domain? OK, uh, so tackling this question, I would just want to say is that your domain, whether you want to go into analytics, if I understand correctly, is or engineering or science, uh, is that you have the freedom to go to either of these uh, once you have the basic skills. So this is very similar to you know your first year of college, where a lot of the courses, most of the courses are common for everybody. And that's where you decide where you want to lean into. So what we do here is that with Python, uh, we give you a very good, we give you a taste of uh, every little bit of uh, aspect that you know happens inside in all of these verticals or these domains. So uh, then at the end of that, you will have you know the ability to possibly a little bit more insight to decide whether what interests you more? What do you want to explore? And uh, yeah, uh, we could probably possibly go into a little bit of counseling after that. OK, so we'll just take a few more questions. Uh, Ishika says, uh, which is more important for data science, Java or Python? OK, so uh, the short answer, I, I would say it's Python. Uh, the long answer is that, see, with uh, all the Java, you can do uh, a lot of data science work with Java. There are enough libraries, enough platforms on it. But with Python, the thing is that uh, every major cross-platform library or platform, it's written in Python. So if you, you talk about PyTorch or Keras, or if you even talk about something extremely specific like CUDA or CUDNM, uh, I'm throwing around a lot of jargon and terms here, but uh, you can probably just Google these up later. And uh, yeah, you will see that Python is the common thread among all of these. And uh, the best part about this is that because after learning this, you can you have the freedom to pick and choose uh, where you want to go, what do you want to explore, and how you can uh, try to build something new with that. OK, right. So. Let's go to the next question from Haridas. So he says that, uh, let's read the question. It says, uh, domain knowledge means, I think, uh, knowledge of industries, which uh, which you would probably work at, or you know, say, for example, car selling or car parts. And uh, it gives you an edge analysis. That is exactly right. Yeah. Uh, you're spot on, Hari. So what that means, uh, what that actually implies is that, uh, if depending on the field that you work in, you need to be more adaptive and uh, you know adjust to the sort of business scenario that's happening there. So you will see that sales, for example, in one domain is completely different from sales in another domain. So physical marketing, if you are uh, doing sales at a physical supermarket, you will find that uh, it is completely different from you know doing sales from an online store. So although the domain is also the same, uh, but there are differences on 
the sort of platforms that you are working on. So if you are an online store that is competing with Amazon, you will find it extremely difficult. Uh, you will have to come up with you know innovative ideas to possibly beat Amazon in the local area that you're serving. If you are a physical store, uh, you have to compete with uh, some online features and also all the other physical stores with you. So this is something uh, I would say is that when you actually go start working in the real world, uh, you see that the point is to understand very closely what is the product that you are working for and that you are building. And that is exactly the crux of domain knowledge. OK. All right. So uh, a key helper says, can data analytics or data science be used in the stock market? Uh, yes, absolutely. In fact, uh, data analytics is uh, the stock market is the first place where data analytics uh, sort of gained prominence because uh, of you know this entire novel thing of uh, stock predictions using data science and data analytics. Uh, in fact, the first example that you will, if you Google data analysis stock market, you will see uh, a lot of programs, a lot of products that are uh, taking you know, past stock data, stock market information, and they're predicting future stocks on it. This is this is the entire game of the stock market. It's speculation. And um, you will see that now this has been taken to the next step. In fact, uh, this stock market prediction has further evolved and automated to a point where people have designed systems that will not only predict what the next stock price would be, but also take a decision as to uh, what stock to buy and when do I sell the stock that I'm holding now? So if I am a person, I'm a company that is doing uh, that is doing high frequency trading in the stock market every day. Uh, instead of having people who are looking at the market every five minutes, every 10 minutes, and making those uh, spot decisions as to do I sell, do I buy, uh, that involves a lot of fatigue. People get tired making decisions. So. That's how these sort of automations, these applications, help the company do consistent decision making uh, throughout the day. And I would say stock market is uh, like an excellent uh, application for data science analytics. It's the first place you would look. OK. Right. So Asta says, uh, how is this useful in economics? OK. So again, uh, so. Uh, Economics being, you know, economics is, I would say, well, extremely closely tied to statistics because you do deal with statistics of demand and supply. I'm not going to get uh, into the details of, say, any specific application, but uh, let's just say that uh, you can use these Python uh, analysis methods to uh, help you out with, you know, uh, to decide with your basic analysis that you would do in, say, any economics field. OK, right. Uh, so yeah, Tushar, I think we are a little bit over time. So is it OK if we close the questions over here? Uh, OK, sir, uh, we can close the session over here. And right. uh, I would like to just add a few things that uh, many of people were asking us that uh, is this uh, uh, means this course is going to be full or it is going to be free. So it is going to be a free course for uh, only for college yeah, students. So if you're a student of uh, Khalsa, JN Khalsa College, it is entirely free for you because uh, I'm pretty sure that Khalsa is, we are working with Rusa uh, to give you this entire course offering for free. So within you know your current holiday season, uh, it will be done, I would say, well within three to four weeks. And you would get to learn a lot. So uh, the requirement is, is that you attend lectures daily and you do take the course seriously. Because although we will start very lightheartedly, you know, uh, very casually, where uh, you are writing, you know, just your first program, you're doing, uh, you're learning, you know, more about what are data types, uh, how do you change from, say, an integer to a string or uh, casual things. But towards the end, we will ramp up to a level where uh, you're probably writing slightly complex program and uh, but what will happen is that throughout our faculty will be hold hand holding you they will be guiding you and uh, what will happen is you will have a sense of accomplishment because uh, at the end if you see just 
three weeks before what I was doing. And today what I'm doing is that uh, you will have created a lot of programs. And uh, uh, I think that should definitely be something that everybody can take away. OK. Uh, anything, any other uh, blanket questions that we are getting, very commonly accepted questions from everyone? Uh, about the course details only. The, uh, they were asking about the course details. Right. So uh, let's do one thing. Uh, in the registration form that we will float soon, how about we add a little short section on uh, everything that is taught in the course? OK, sir. Yeah, sir. so I'm sure everybody will have a, a written note in it. OK. Yes, sir. I will share the course details with them uh, shortly. It's after sure. the session, we could discuss something, and uh, I will share everything with them. Absolutely. All right. Oh, OK, sir. So should we conclude today's session? Yes, yes. OK, so I would like to thank you, sir, personally, and uh, also, ma'am, for the presence. And uh, this uh, lecture was very uh, knowledgeable for us. Hope uh, our students would have been uh, generated some uh, interest in this field as Python. Mm -hmm. So I just uh, want to say for the old students that uh, you. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah. Thanks, Tushar. So uh, there is so much that I wanted to touch on in today's session, but uh, with just one hour, uh, we can't, you know, go into the depths of so many things. And there are so many interesting conversations to be had. But uh, I hope that everybody uh, gains some insight into the field in general and uh, you know how this course can probably help you. Yes. All right. Yeah, uh, Tushar, I want to thank uh, Khalsa College Management and Busa for giving us a wonderful opportunity to work together. Yes, I was. Uh, yes, sorry, ma'am. Uh, I was uh, about to tell that only that I also want to thank uh, Khalsa College and uh, principal of Khalsa College, Dr. Kiran Mangalkar sir, our uh, EC cell head, uh, Dr. Pratiksha ma'am, our uh, chairman uh, of uh, our uh, Khalsa College and uh, Rosa also. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, likewise, Tushar. So thanks so much. And thank you to the IT team for setting up the live stream and uh, just organizing a great event. Yes, uh, special thanks to IT team, uh, Alan, sir, and Ashish, sir. Yes. So we can conclude today's session. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Have a good day. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a nice day.